Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is T. Hatchet coming to you from Untapped Music Radio. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will be glad and rejoice in it. We are running a little late this morning through technical difficulties, but I am here. Um, I have a word for you today. And so it might turn into a lot. You know, we never know where God's going to lead us. I told you I am totally led. For those of you who know me know that I'm totally led by God. So however God wants us to go is the way we go. And I'm just feeling a, a, a huge word from him today. So we're going to get right into it. Um, the subject today is be careful not to replan God's plan. Now, I know that sounds like a lot. It sounds like a oxymoron, but trust me, it is not. It is God's word, and we are going to get into it very shortly. I want you guys to give me a minute. And we will get into the world, okay? Okay, brothers and sisters, thank you for that minute. Now we're going to, good morning, Char. Good morning. God bless you. Good morning, Katrina. I see my sisters in Christ on here this morning. It is a blessing, a blessing to see you guys this morning. Um, Thank you for the support. I really, really appreciate it. As I said, God has a huge word for us this morning. So we're going to go ahead and get started in the huge word. And as I said, it is the topic today is be careful not to replan God's plan. And trust me, as I said, it is not an oxymoron. It is something that is, well, we're going to just get into it, okay? The reading is coming from Deuteronomy 1, chapter 1, 19. 20 through 28, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 1, 20 through 28. I'm going to give you guys a minute to get that. For those of you who want to read along. Good morning, sister. My sister Valerie is on. And that reads as thus. I say to you, you have now reached the hill country of the Amor Amorites that the Lord our God has given us. Look, he has placed the land in front of you. Go and occupy it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors has promised you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. But you all come to me and say, first, let's see. I'll send out our scouts to explore the land for us. They will advise us on the best route to take and which towns we should enter. This seems like a good idea to me. So I chose 12 scouts, one from each of your tribes. They headed for the hill country and came to the valley of Ishkol and explored it. They picked some of its fruits and brought it back to us. And they reported, the land the Lord has given us is indeed a good land. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God and refused to go in. Your complaints in your tents, you complained in your tents and said, the Lord must hate us 
That's why he has brought us here from Egypt to hand us over to the Amontes, Amorites, excuse me, y'all, to be slaughtered. Let us pray. Oh, El Shaddai, I come to you this morning in no shape, form, or fashion, giving you all the honor and all the praise, thanking you for waking us up this morning, thanking you for starting us on our day, thanking you for last night's laying down, thanking you that when we rose, we was in our right minds and reasonable health. Jehovah Jireh, our provider, I pray this morning that you speak to me and speak through me. I pray that you convict my heart and the hearts of those within the sound of my voice. Jehovah Ishkanu, let the applications I administer for my studies be your applications from for your people. Remove my ego, remove my wants and wishes, and remove my desires for a platform and influence. On this day, I praise your name and thank you for your infinite love, grace, and mercy. I thank you for being omnipresent. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's get into this today. Be careful not to replan God's plan. Now, as I said, it sounds like an oxymoron to me. But let's think about that. What is replanning God's plan? Now, it might sound like, well, if God gives us a plan, why would we replan it? Or how can we replan God's plan? Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you about that. Because <laughs> I have done that a time or two myself. Matter of fact, I have done that recently, okay? So let's talk about replanning God's plan. I'm going to tell you a little story. Or, you know, for those who know me, I like to tell my little stories. <laughs> a testify and what I call it. There was a time when I was living in Georgia and I um, was living, basically I moved to Georgia by myself away from my family. I had family in Georgia, but um, I had moved from where my sisters live and, you know, where my kids was. And during that time in Georgia, I went through what I call a, a transformation, you know, renewing your mind and your body and your spirit, you know. And I did that. And during that time, God started to speak to me. And one of the things he told me is I was going to go back. I was going to go back to Virginia where my children was and where my family was. But at the time, my sister, I had a sister that was in Rhode Island and she had been in Rhode Island, I don't know, for maybe a year or so. And he told me I was going to go to Rhode Island and get her. And then we were going to go back to um, Virginia. Now, I, he didn't give me the full plan, but that's what he told me. And he told me all we needed to do was find a house in Virginia. Well, shortly after that, because at the time I wasn't working and I didn't have any money and I was thinking, you know, and I got sick on top of that. Yeah, I, that, that, I failed to mention that. I got sick on top of that. So I was sick for about five weeks, almost died. You know, I was in the bed, couldn't move, weak and everything. When I came out of my sickness, um, I just had this feeling. I had to get out of Georgia. I needed to go get my sister and do what God had told me. And right at that moment, three days after I was healed from the sickness, my sister called me and said, well, you know, I'm you know, in Rhode Island, I, I'm getting ready to go to do the surgery. I don't have nobody with me to help me. And can you come to Georgia? Can you come to Rhode Island? So that was my sign or my leeway. So I went to Rhode Island. Matter of fact, my sister in Christ, um, Katrina, is on. She's the one who we got on the road through faith. <laughs> we had no money. She didn't have no money. She had a car, though. And when I told her, you know, I need to get to Rhode Island to my sister, I don't have no money. We did what we had to do because she's faith led also. Um, God bless her. And we just bought, packed as much of my stuff as we could in her van. And we headed on the road with no money, but with faith. Okay. And faith got us to Rhode Island and it got her back to Georgia. So amen. God is good. Okay. Um, but when I got to Rhode Island, I sent 
my sister down and I started to have a talk with her about, you know, God's plans for us. And she was all for, and she was like, okay, yeah, amen. And then we said, well, let's sit down and make a plan. That's replanning God's plan. Because if you think about it, God had already given us the plan. But when God gives us something, the first thing we do is we want to sit down and make a replan his plan. We don't, we don't usually walk by faith. As the word says, we walk by sight and not by faith which is the opposite of what the word tells us to do. And the reason why we do that is because our flesh get caught up in what we see. And so when God gives us something to do, we think it's best if we replan it or we think, oh, well, maybe God didn't see that block right there. So I have to turn left to avoid that block because God didn't tell me about that because our, our, our flesh get jittery. We think we're supposed to be making a plan. Just recently, um, we went through that as a family. We are we started to replan this plan that God has for us. And what happens is when, and I don't want to get too far ahead because this is in the story, but what happens when you replan God's plan, God gets angry and he takes you back. Whereas you could have been in you could have been two steps ahead. God pushed you back four steps because he said, you're not ready for it. You're not ready for my blessing because you don't trust me. Because if you trust me, you would do what I said. If you trust me, you will walk by faith and not try to fix the plan or try to fix something. That he didn't ask. God don't need our help. That's the hardest thing for us. We think God need our help. You know, well, let me help him do this. Or let me help him do that. Because he probably ain't see that little block in the road. Or he probably ain't see that, that hole right there. So I'm going to have to go left. It's not God that don't see. It's us that don't see. What we don't see is God has laid himself down. Jesus laid himself down. Down. So if there's a hole right there and God has directed us that way, we have to rest assured that God will lay his body down so that we can walk across. You know how you, you see these romantic new movies where uh, the guy take his coat and lay it down in the water so the girl can walk across the puddle? That's God. God is that and more. So if he gives us a, a route to go, we must trust in him and walk by faith and not by sight to that road, through that road. It's just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They trusted him. They walked through the fire because they believed that he, God would be there. They believed that they would not get burned. They knew that he had them. And if there was a fire, then they were meant to walk through it. But our flesh gets a hold of us, takes a hold of us, and we don't do that. We plan. Well, you know, we got to do this. We don't want to get here and do that. Uh, um, with me and my sister, we, we tried to replan it, and my sister was like, well, how are we going to get the money for this? Or what are we going to do with that? And I kept telling her all the time, I don't know. God just said, find a house which is what he told me. He said to find a house in Virginia and he would do everything else. And I, I, I trusted in that and I stayed in that. And I just said, okay. And I kept reminding her, God just said, find a house. And when I tell you that when we found that house, when we did as God told us to do, he made everything else come. But in in our travels, in doing that, what happens is somewhere we lose the faith. Because even after you get to that point, you sort of be like, well, why I have to go through this? Or why I have to go through that? Or look, there's a roadblock right there. And so I can't 
go any further. We complain and we whine, which is what this story is about in Deuteronomy. Moses, for those of who you who know the story, Moses, God had Moses lead his people, Moses and Aaron, lead his people out of slavery, out of Egypt. And the people complained the whole way. They complained about not eating. They complained about being in a forest. Everything was a complaint. And yet God still led them and gave them, you know, the pillow, the cloud, the pillow of cloud. I am with you at all times. They still complained. They was hungry. God fed them with a uh, uh, two fish and a, a, a loaf of bread. They still complained. The whole God showered food down to them. They still complained. Everything was a complaint with them. And God was still with them. God still trying to tell you, hey, I'm directing you. Hey, I'm here with you. But it was complaint after complaint after complaint manner. Yes. Thank you, Ma. And that's what we do. So in this story in Deuteronomy 20, it says, I say to you, you have now reached the hill country of the Amorites, Amorites, that the Lord our God is given us. Look, he has placed the land in front of you. Go and occupy it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors has promised. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Now, what's amazing to me is this whole time, God was saying, this is your land. This is yours. There is no doubt this is your land. All you have to do is enter it. And at this time in Deuteronomy in chapter one, God has already led them through out of Egypt and across the great wilderness. He, um, the Deuteronomy was camping um, at the east of Jordan River in the land of Mohab. Now that's where they was at this time on, in verse, 20. They were right at the edge, y'all. They was right. Imagine this. Now, just stay with me for a minute. Imagine God waking you up one morning and saying, go, I say Aruba because that's one of my favorite places, <laughs> vacation place, Aruba. Imagine God saying to you, I'm going to give you Aruba, the whole island. Go to Aruba. I'm going to give it to you. What would you do, brothers and sisters? Would you be, look, for me, the way I'm feeling, I would walk there if I had to. I'd probably dance the first mile. <laughs> then I'd get tired. Maybe even not a mile. I don't even know if I could walk that far. <laughs> but, you know, I would dance for a little while, maybe an hour. Maybe I could dance for an hour. Then I'd have to rest. But I would find my way to the Aruba because I'd be like, Daddy said, I go, I get Aruba. I get that island. I'm going to Aruba, Aruba. <laughs> you know? But that's the position that the Israelites was in. God was giving them not just a house, not just, you know, a, just, just an apartment. He was giving them land. He was giving them, if you look at it in layman terms, a whole town. All they had to do is get there. God said, it's yours. It didn't matter. It doesn't matter what was there, what, what was going on. It's yours. All you got to do is just get there. It's yours. And when they first left, they had faith enough to leave with, with Moses. But then came the distractions. Then, then, then came the, um, oh, we hungry. Oh, um, we're in the wilderness. Oh, this is going to happen to us. Uh, the, oh, all the things that we go through in life that distract us. And, and and weaken our faith. And that we walk by sight and not by faith. That's what the Israelites was going through. They were distracted. And they wasn't closing their eyes. Uh, two sermons ago, I talked about don't look at what is, close your eyes and listen to what God is. 
that's what the Israelites did. They weren't looking at what they wasn't closing their eyes and listening to what God said it was going to be. They was looking at what is. Now in now Jeremy 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are the plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. But in this case, mom said, remember, they were coming from 400 years of slavery, slavery mindset. And they actually had to learn to trust God again. Most of all, built a rapport with him. That is true. That is true. They had a slavery mentality. But when we will compare this to this day, we often, even though we're not in the slavery times, we often also have a slavery mentality. We often also don't um, close our eyes and listen to what God says it's going to be. Often we look at what is, and that set us back because God get angry. Oh, yeah, God can get angry with us, which is what happened in this story. 23 says, 22 says, but you all come to me and said, first, let's send out scouts to explore the land for us. They will advise us on the best route to take and which towns we should enter. Now, Moses, he said, this seemed like a good idea to him. So I choose. So he chose 12 scouts, one from each of the tribes to go out. And remember, now he's he's sending for Moses. Now he's thinking, OK, they they know that God's going to give them the land. But we do need to see where we're entering, which land we're going to take. So it makes sense, you know, to send out some scouts. And so everybody don't have to go and, and find out which land they want to settle in, which which piece of land they want to settle in. Um, so he, he said, okay, I'm going to send out 12 scouts to go find out which way we're going to enter, which land we're going to get. That's what Moses was thinking. <laughs> but verse 25 through 20 says, said they picked some of it, its fruits, which was the 12 scouts that he sent out and brought it back to us. And they reported the land the Lord our God has given us is indeed a good land. But you rebel against the command of the Lord your God and refuse to go in it. You complain in your tents and say, the Lord must hate us. That's why he has brought us here from Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to be slaughtered. See, throughout that time that they were traveling in the wilderness, that God has brought them out of slavery, they never they still had their slave mentality mind. They never looked at the positive. They never looked at God has brought us this far. God has brought us through the wilderness. We are on the edge of the promised land. All we have to do is enter. Throughout all that time, they still had that slavery mentality. And they did not trust God totally. You know, a lot of times our flesh get the best of us. Hey, sister. And we know that God is real. We know that God will do for us. But we don't totally trust God. We teeter-totter. We teeter-totter on the, 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 um, in the middle of the line, you know. We trust them, but something, the least little thing happened, and we're over at the on the other side. You know, because, again, we're walking by sight and not by faith. And the Lord, the Bible says that if we have faith of a mustard seed. But that's hard sometimes because our flesh takes over. I mean, like I said, just recently, it happened to me. It happened to me um, three, four years back. You know, God had told my husband and I to move 
back to Georgia. He placed that on our heart to move back to Georgia. And we were excited at first. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, we're going to do that. But then we started, our flesh started to take over. And we were like, okay, well, we have to go visit our family in New Jersey first. And, oh, um, we went to New Jersey and we spent a lot of money, the money we had. So then, oh, well, we have to um, stay in Virginia and I have to work and make more money so that we can make this move. We started replanning God's plan. That's what we started doing. And so it's like, oh, well, we have to do this. Oh, well, we're not ready to go because we need to do this first. And then, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't go to, you know, we could stay here in Virginia. We can find a place to to stay in Virginia. And we did all of this. And we replanned God's plan more than once. Trust me, more than once. And guess what happened? We ended up at first not having the money that we had to even get the place, the security for the place. We ended up being homeless. We ended up being broke, busted and disgusted. The car broke down. We had all sorts of problems because we did not follow what God had told us for in the beginning. So God took us through some changes because we didn't trust him and we didn't follow him. And what ended up happening is we we finally got sense. <laughs> we finally came to our senses and we said, okay, we're going to follow God. We are going, no matter what happened, we're going to Georgia. We move. We don't care what is getting in our way. We're going to Georgia. And we jumped in the car. Well, first we found a home within two weeks. Once we decided to trust God and we jumped in the car with minimal stuff, because trust me, we didn't have that much stuff. We couldn't even afford a big truck and it didn't matter because we didn't even have enough stuff for a big truck. Um, and we jumped into our car, which was not working that well, but by the grace of God, it sure worked enough to bring us down here. Trust me with no problems. And we moved into a home with minimum furniture. We had a um, mattress from one of the day beds. And within a month, we had so much furniture in the house that we couldn't even move. And it was too much furniture. But that's what happens when you follow God. Without question. Or when you walk by faith and not by sight. But when you want to take it out of God's hands, God will allow you to take it out of his hand. If you if you want to put your hand in it and do it, God will allow you to do it. Okay, go ahead, you do it. But see what happens when you do it. <laughs> it's not going to be <laughs> as nice as it could be if God if you let God handle it. And this is what was happening to the Israelites. They were not looking at, they, they kept their slave mentality. They was not looking at God and what God had done and could done. And they trusted him, but they trusted him eh, when things was good. When there wasn't, they thought they were supposed to have a free ride. That's what it was. They thought there was not going to be no trials and tribulations that they could just, they were going to get to the promised land and poof, they, they would, everything would be cool. But God didn't say that. As a matter of fact, in John 10, John 10, 10, his words say that the thief cometh not but to kill, to steal and destroy. But I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And in that, God is telling us that there's going to be trials and tribulations. Oh, they're coming. But I am here that I may protect you. I am here for you. I am here by your side. So if that truck hits you, I'm going to get in front of you. And it's not going to hurt you. So if 
it seems like your light's going to get cut off. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But whatever happens, I'll guide you to the light. If you have cancer, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I will protect you. I will put my arms around you. I will see you through it. And see, the Israelites, their faith wasn't that strong. They didn't, they didn't, they, they believed in God, but they didn't believe him enough that he would be there to protect them, that they, he would stand in front of that car and not let anything help hurt them, that he would make sure that their bellies are full. And even though he showed them time and time again, each time to them, it seems like things, the, the tribes and tribulations got bigger or was in a, a different type. So for them, it was like, yeah, well, he might have helped us over here, but he ain't see that right there. And how many times, brothers and sisters, do we do that? Do we doubt God? Do we doubt that he's going to make something happen? Because maybe it's not the standard. Or maybe it's not um, what we think it should be. Or maybe we feel like it's too big for God. How many times do we put God in a box and think, well, yeah, well, this is too big for him. Or sometimes, how many times do we misinterpret the word provisions? Where we say, well, God didn't give us a provision for that. God usually give me a provision so I know it's him. That's not what provision mean. And we're going to have a sermon on that too one day. We're going to talk about that. Not this Sunday, but we're going to talk about that. That's not what provision mean. But how many times do we do that? How many times do we sit down and we spend hours or days replanning God's plan? To the way we think it's going to be. To, we, to the way that we think. And what do we know? My mother-in-law says all the time, I'll say to her, well, God said this, but he ain't tell me how. And her first words is, it's not your business. And how true that is. We are only to do what God asks us to do. How it's going to get done or when it's going to get done, not our business. As a matter of fact, I have have adopted that when when I'm feeling when I'm feeling a little anxious about what God has given me to do. I I always hear my mother in law's voice in my head going, "Not my business, not my business." So I repeat that to myself: "It's not my business. I just need to work, focus on what He told me to do, and don't worry about how how everything else is going to come together. And it's not my business." That's what we need to remind ourselves. It's not how. If God gives us something, we just need to be thankful and accept it. Or go get it. Or place ourselves in that position. We can't worry about, well, how am I going to do this? Well, how am I not? How, how this? Well, I don't have the money for this. It's not our business. And with God, that ain't what it's about. With the Israelites in this story, it wasn't their business. God has already said the promised land. As simple as that. It's not even land, the promised land. The promised land is the land that God promised to the Israelites. Lights. And instead of focusing on that, their minds are still in slavery, and that's what they focus on. Not, I'm getting ready to go into a land of milk and honey. I'm getting ready to go in. I'm taking possession of this land God has given me. How great thou art. Who am I? Like I said, let God say, wake up one morning and God tell me to go Aruba. I, I ain't worried about I'm getting there. I'm, I'm like, you're going to see me, I can't talk now. I'm going to ruin. 
God just gave me possession of a river. I'm out of here. You know, whoever ain't coming, too bad. Whoever think I'm crazy, too bad. I'm out. <laughs> you know? I don't know how I'm going to get that. To, uh, listen, he ain't say all that. He ain't tell, that ain't my business. I just know I need to get there. And that's the way I'm going. And it's hard sometimes. Like I said, there has been times when I'm like, okay, God told me to do this. Okay, so how am I supposed to do this? And then I have to think. I have to be reminded of what my mother-in-law said. Not my business. So now all I have to do is pray to God. Okay, God, give me strength. God, if you want me to do this, then please give me what I need. Give me the tools. Speak to me. Speak to me. Because I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I'm one of these God's children that everything is a challenge to me. <laughs> It's like God to tell me, play something on my heart. And I'll be like, oh, you want me to do that? Well, God, I don't know how to do that. Well, you're going to have to tell me. I'm one of those children. Mm -hmm. Almost like the Israelites, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But what I have learned over the last, just recently, over the last maybe two, three years since this move to Georgia, I have learned to stop complaining. And just follow him. Because trust me, now I get convicted quicker. <laughs> just like this um, Sunday project that we have where I speak to you every Sunday. When he first placed that on my heart, that was, you know, wait a minute, Lord. You want me to get up on my day off and and, and 9 o'clock in the morning? That's my only day off. And, you know, it's time with me and my husband. And I really... Do I really have to do that? And, you know, God convicted me. He reminded me, well, number one, that husband that you sharing time on, your only day to share time with him, I gave you that gift. He reminded me that Sunday that you want, you don't want to get up at nine o'clock in the morning. I wake you up. Hmm. <laughs> So what then? I had to say, okay, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what what did you what do you want me to do? Okay, I'm on it. Because that's what we do. How often do we whine and complain? We pray for something, then we get in and we whine and complain about it. We pray. Well, I want to talk to the women for a little bit. I want to step on your shoot your your toes a, just a little bit this morning. What about when you pray for that man? Which um, I have my beliefs about. I I don't believe a woman should pray for a man, but there are times and women do do it. What about when you pray for that man and God gives you that man? Then you gotta come. Well, he you know do this. What, what, can you fix it? First of all. That goes into a whole nother sermon because one of the things you have to do is be careful what you pray for and how you pray for it. You need to be specific when you're praying for something. That's the first thing. <laughs> and the second thing is when God gives you something, you got to appreciate it. And when God lays something on your heart to do, you got to do it. You can't complain about it. Because if we think about all the things that God does for us and all the things that God gives us, what right? Who are we to complain? But we do get arrogant. Don't get me wrong. We do get arrogant. We do think we know it all. And that's why we replay in God's plan. Because we think we know it all. Sometimes we get above God. And that's where the replanting comes in. Well, you know, there's a hole right there. I know he told me to go straight, but that hole right there. So, you know, I'll just help him out and I, I'll, I'll go left and go down the street and around the corner to avoid that hole. Yeah, that'll help him out. 
Maybe there's a reason why God did not want us to go left and down the street and around the corner. Maybe there's a reason why God wanted us to go over that hole. Maybe that left down the street, two miles missing. There's a bigger hole that we definitely going to fall in. But we don't think that way. Just like the Israelites did not think about what God had done for them thus far. Now, again, they were on the edge. All they had to do is go and take possession. And Moses thinking, hey, you know, maybe their family getting it. I, I'm just imagining if I was Moses, this is what I would have. Maybe their family getting it, you know. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's send out instead of having, you know, or everybody go and, and scout out a piece of the land. I'll just send out 12 from each tribe to scout out, you know, a place. He thought it was a good idea. He had no idea that even though he thought they were scouting out where to enter, you know, and picking the piece of land, that what they really were scouting at is whether they could go in this land. Believe it or not, and and for us it sounds when I I'm sure I'm not the only one. When we read the Bible, we read different things in the Bible. We think, how are these people? You know, why they couldn't see what God done? So we stand in judgment, which the Bible also says, "Does not yet ye be judged." But we do. We stand in judgment uh, uh, when we read the Bible, because of course we are so much better. <laughs> Of course, that's what we think. Oh, we would never have to. You know how people will see a movie and they, oh, why she do that? I would never have to. But you really don't know what you would do in that situation. So never say never. And never stand in judgment of people. And we find that we do that a whole lot. You know, what we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. You know, how could, couldn't they see God was helping them? Why would they? When we do the same thing in life. We be playing God's plan all the time. Just because we read it and we see it's so evident to us that, you know, they should have seen that God was on their side and they should have just accepted it. But if we couldn't do it, what makes us think they could do it? What makes us any better than them? The world is not flat. The world is a circle. It goes around. So the same thing that they did, we do, just in a different manner. Same game, different players. We don't realize that when we stand in judgment of what other people do, that we're really in judgment of ourselves. Hmm. Think about that. Did I step on your toes a little? <laughs> excuse me. Let me just say, excuse me in advance, because I'm going to step on your toes a little. But this is not my word. This is God's word. This is what we do and we see every day in, when we read our word. We see that we read the Bible. We, we see different stories that we think, well, how could they not see God? Or how could they not do that? And not even reading the Bible, in life itself, we'll see a movie or something, or we'll see somebody doing something. Why are they doing that? Can't they see this? The grass is always greener on the other side. That is so true. But if we just step back and look at ourselves, look in that mirror, it's a reflection of us. Sounds simple, don't it? A reflection of us. What? Well, Duh, I know that. But do we really? And how often do we look in that mirror to see a reflection of us? To see what we do instead of looking at others and what they do. Now, let's go back to the Israelites because by this time, 
they had the 12 scouts have went to the land and they scouted it out and they brought back yeah it's full of food and they were excited for a moment but then the 12 scouts well actually only 10 of the scouts because there was two scouts that still had faith in god the scouts you see when they brought the food back they was like well yeah the food is and the land is rich but there are giants in the land because the uh, amorites was tall big people you know six feet and above they was huge people so to them they were giants so they felt like there's giants in the land and god brought us here and the giants is gonna beat us and conquer us and why did god bring us to this land again they wasn't thinking god already promised this land so he he god knows the giants there god knows that 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 there's people inhabiting the land as a matter of fact god's plan was for the israelites to defeat them and and to to take possession of the land but they didn't think about that. They was thinking, oh, we can't do this. You know, they were afraid and, and scared. Oh, we can't take the possession because they went by what the 10 told them. And that's important because, as I said, he Moses sent out 12 scouts. And out of the 12, 10 had the idea of, you know, God has led us to an ambush. God, you know. We we can't take possession because there's giants in the land, and also though the food is plentiful and milk and honey, this belongs to these giants. And you know, and if we go in there and try to take possession of them, they're going to rule over us. However, there was two scouts, Joshua and Caleb, who felt like. Well, they pointed out that the land is fertile. Listen, guys, they were saying, listen, hey, wait, the land is fertile. The enemies are vulnerable. And most importantly, God is on our side. They believed, they knew God was on their side. They believed if God brought them to it, God would bring them to it. But it was only two of them against 10. And the people, with to the 10 and not to the two. And how many times does that happen? Of course, majority rules, majority rules. That, that's what we're told in society, majority rules. So why would you listen to the two when you got 10 saying, mm -mm, this ain't working? Those 10 got in the people's head where the people did not even believe that, oh, God can't say, why he bring us here for destruction? And even though Joshua and Caleb believed that God would bring us, them through it and, and keep his promise, it was just them too. And the people was angry and would not listen to them. Now, here's what, here's what. I want to read to you, which wasn't in the verse, but this is very pertinent. Because remember, I told you I didn't want to get too far ahead. But remember, I said, God gets angry. So you know what happened to the Israelites, even though they were right there? Now, I, I try not to go um, too far into geographics and things like that. I want to make it very simple. And the reason be is because God placed it on my heart. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in um, the whole geographics and, and things like that. And we lose the message. I don't want you guys to lose the message. So we're not going to get too caught up in where the Jordan River was and where they was. Um, but I will say that they were right. The, they were right on the edge. They were across the Jordan River is right there, close to the Promised Land. So they were right there. And the reason why that point is important because it was like 
it's like if you had to go across the street and to own a big mansion, you lived in a little house and a big mansion was across the street. And all you had to do is walk across the street to the big, big mansion. It's like that. But because of what the 12, the 10 scouts said, and because of them not having total faith in God, they rebelled. Now, oh, well, he, God brought us here to get us beat up. God, we're going to get killed. Why would he, we could have stayed in slavery. That was their idea. You know, after all that, that was their, their thought, you know, why would he do this to us? And it's like a tease, you know, showing us a land that we can't have, even though God has said, this is your land. I promise you this land. Ah, no, nah, you know, why would he do this? And so in verse 34, still chapter one of Deuteronomy, it says, when the Lord heard your complaining, he became very angry. So he suddenly swore, not one of you from his wicked, from this wicked generation will live to see the good land. I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb and just Joshua. He will see this land because he has followed the Lord completely. I will give to him and his ancestors some of the very land he explored during his scouting mission. So you see, because they believed, Caleb and Joshua, because they believed in God and his promise, they got to go through the promised land. But you know what happened to the other Israelites? They was pushed back into the wilderness. That's where the 40 days and the 40 nights came in. At. You see, they didn't have to wander through the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The reason why they were in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights is because of their disbelief, because they didn't have the faith. Because they didn't trust God. And God got angry about it. So when it comes to getting angry, that's what I was saying before. You see, God will get angry with us. God will take his hand out of something. If we choose to pull our hand in, if we choose to be in control of something, God will take and remove his hand. And let us do it. And oh boy, I'm going to tell you, I would rather trust in God. Now this is just me. <laughs> But I would rather trust in God than let me have, because I, I know that I know. Anything I put my hands on, I might destroy. I, it, it's going to be a whole mess. I've been there and done that. So I trust in God. I trust in his word. I trust and believe that he will do what he says he's going to do. And it's not always easy. It's not always nice. But what I know and what is always is God's love and God's grace and mercy. God is infinite. His love lasts forever. There's no ending and no beginning. God is omnipresent. He put, he's everywhere at all times. In our hearts, our minds, our every facet of our home. God is immense. He participates in his creation. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. We can do all things through God who strengthens us. God is immutable. He's never changing. So even though we wishy-washy and we change and change our minds and go through a bunch of changes in five minutes, I might not be or think the way I think. God is immutable. He never changes. 
And most of all, God is infallible. He doesn't make mistakes. We make a thousand, but God don't make mistakes. So you see, when we don't replan God's plan, when we just stick to God's plan, oh, how beautiful the promised land is. But when we put our hand in it, we're going to be wondering for 40 years, 40 days and 40 nights. We're going to be wondering in the wilderness because we going to make a mess of things. <laughs> as simple as that. We are going to make a mess of things. We are not God. We can't see what God sees. God knows what we're going to do before we do it. God gives us something. If he gives us a plan to do, he already knows there might be a hole or a block right there. But what's around the corner might be worse than that one little block or that one little tiny hole. It might be a whole missing block around the corner. So what makes us think that we know more than God? What makes us think that we could do more than God? What makes us put God in a box? And say, oh, well, I believe in God. I don't know about this. I'm going to have to do this. Because that's what we do. We put God in a block box. When we say, well, you know, we have to do this. You know, God said this, but we, we need to do this. We need to help him out. The other thing is, which my, my mother-in-law mentioned, the slavery mentality. It's not just a slave mentality. It's also that we don't believe that we're deserving. That's in some cases. We don't believe that we're deserving of the greatness, God's gifts. So if we get something, let's say, um, a house or something that we we want. God said, okay, I'm going to give you this house. We complain because we don't believe that we're deserving of it. That's along the lines of the slavery mentality. You know, the Israelites was enslaved so long and, and was treated so badly that they did not believe that they could do anything or they had the strength to do anything or that they could have this land. They always thought of doom and destruction that they wasn't going to make nothing. They was even when God was promising them, their mentality was, "I'm not going. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not. I can't do this. I'm weak. I'm this. I'm that." They were beat down mentally, and to this day, we still are somewhat beat down mentally, where we feel like we don't deserve certain things. That that we can't get that dream that we we are because it's impossible because society will tell us that's not the standard that's not the things the way things happen you just can't walk up into some place there's there's rules and regulations you gotta have this you gotta do this but if god says it then why do we have to have this we don't why do we have to do this? We don't. Because God is in control. And as much as we want to believe that, we forget that sometimes. We don't have that sometimes. So what we do to compensate is we replan God's plan, basically. <laughs> That's what we do. Replan God's plan. Because it makes us feel more secure. Like we doing something. But check this out. A lot of times also, and this is old, going in left field, y'all. A lot of all the time, when we were replaying God's plan and it don't work out, what we do? Who we blame? 
We don't look at ourselves and say, well, maybe I shouldn't replay and God plan. We look at God and we go, oh, why did you do this to us? Why, why, what you told me to do to ourselves? Why you let this happen to me? Who else did that? The Israelites, didn't they? They replayed God's plan. And when they got sent back, when God pushed them back, then it's like, why are you letting us wonder? Because you didn't have faith in him. And you didn't do go according to his plan. You did according to your plan. Now you whining and blaming him for something you did. That goes back to what I say about we we get a car, we pray for a car or a man or something, and we get it. And then we complain about it. And we blame God. Why he acting like that? Why you? I am for you, brothers and sisters. Don't be playing God's plan. Walk by faith and not by sight. And trust in him. And I'm a witness. He will lead you through no matter what it is, through the fires, through the cold, through the storm, hold on to God's hand. Now, maybe you don't know God like that. There are some that don't. There's some that don't have a relationship with him. Maybe you want to know how to have a relationship with him. Maybe you want to be closer to God. Maybe you're ready to give your all to him, but don't know how. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Proverbs 18.24 said, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Brothers and sisters, for those of you who don't know him, I implore you to get to know him today. And don't replan his plan. Let him make a plan for you and follow his plan. And trust me, he will lead you through it. It's not going to all the time be pretty. It's not going to all the time be a bed of roses. But God says he will prepare a table in front of your enemies. You know what that means? That means that he's not going to let anything touch you. That he's going to shield you. You will have trials and tribulations. You will have, things will happen. Because John 10, 10, his word said so. The enemy will come. Because that's what he's, he, this is his land. The devil was an angel. He was knocked out of heaven, down here. Kicked out of heaven. He's down here. So this is his playground. He rules this world. But God rules everything. God is in control. And if you remember the story of Job, and I implore you to go back and read Job. He was one of God's favorites. Had everything. Lost everything. Except for his faith. And God gave him back ten times because of his faith. So in these days and times, it is really necessary to know God so that he can bring you through. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the word that you brought to us today. We pray that your word touch and or heal someone in any way that they may have needed it. I thank you for enabling me to be your vessel. 
And I pray that you will continue, continuously use me, work with me, and work through me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for being with me again this Sunday for another word from God. I appreciate you. I love you. And until next Sunday, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and grace be with you. This is Minister T. Hatchett. And I'll see you next Sunday.